Yeah, cool. Welcome to Fungo Talk. I'm Matt Smith, your host. So we got Maddie Murata as the co-host. We got uh, the man, Coach Kevin Layden, head coach for Fordham University. How you been, Kev? Well, it's good. Just uh, like everybody else, you know, just itching to get back and frustrated to be uh, stuck, you know, where we are. So, um, yeah. but uh, could be could be worse. So. And you got the three kids at home. Yeah, yeah. So, so how's that? You, you enjoying the family time? Or are they trying to? You're ready to run out of the house right now? No, it's been nice. I mean, it's just kind of hanging at home. Um, you know, catching up with the kids. Uh, you know, obviously this time of year, the spring, normally being so busy, it's um, you know a lot of times you come home from like a a road trip and you feel like your kids have gotten taller. And um, so I've been able to, I guess, maybe slow that down as far as. Um, they're aging with, with at least with my eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. I got the two kids. I, I had no idea your son's name was Owen. So is so is mine. I named him Owen. So nice. Yeah. Hopefully, there's some baseball uh, pop in that name. We'll we'll find out. It's to yeah. be determined. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, congrats on the A10 last year. Second time in the program's history since 1998, which was pretty cool. And uh, how was that experience bringing home that that championship? That was unbelievable. I mean, um, you know, it's just uh, like any, I think, championship team, a lot of times you kind of just um, – things just seem to click and everything falls into place. And, um, you know, you get some breaks, but you also have a lot of talent. And, and um, you know, we, we were just playing really well uh, down the stretch in 2019. Um, our guys, I think, really kind of loosened up and um you know and heated up as the weather uh, got warmer and um you know with the tournament being at Fordham I think it kind of gave our guys a little extra uh boost and a little extra you know confidence that we for some reason have played so well at home I, I don't know um why it is but um you know our record at home has been pretty tremendous over the years so that's awesome it's probably the turf it's, it's got to be maybe the wind factor in Houlihan yeah, yeah, driving those extra balls in the gap. I know. Listen, we've always kind of been like a, a pitching and, and defense-oriented uh, team. And, um, you know, speed has been a big factor, um, you know, whether it's uh, on the bases or defensively. Um, and, it, you know, playing at, at Fordham, a bigger park, and obviously the early, you know, spring when the wind seems to be um, you know, more or less blowing in, it's not conducive for uh, home runs and we've, you know, found ways to adapt to that park. And I, I think um, if you're built like that, maybe, maybe uh, it'd be more of a neutral site. Um, but a lot of teams, you know, they're waiting for that, you know, maybe that three run homer and it's not going to happen at Fordham too often. So. Yeah. 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 Now we're talking about streaks and stuff. I mean, I was checking out you guys 10 and six record. I mean, tough start to FIU. I mean, they got a great program, but you guys figured it out in your last nine games. You've won. You know, you, you got on that hot streak. Was there something that you talked to the guys that got them going, or was it kind of one of the captains stepping up and kind of – what's the secret to that, that the win streak? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, we um, we talked. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> talked to our guys a couple times throughout, you know, the, at least the first, um, first couple weekends, and – you know, it was that frustration part because I felt like we were playing like a um, like a young team, uh, you know, a rookie team, and we had so many um, returning um, position players where, you know, they all had played in a conference tournament, uh, got to the championship game and obviously won it, uh, gone on to regionals. And I didn't notice one, you know, bit of nervousness with our guys in 2019 but to the start of this year, they kind of looked like they were playing a little nervous. And I, I felt like, um, you know, those first couple of weeks, we looked like that. And, you know, once they settled in, um, whether it was that or they just needed time to settle in and get at bats, who really knows? But um, once we settled in, we were, I mean, we were red hot. And, um, you know, that's the difficult part about this whole thing is that I thought we had another really good team. Uh, they could challenge again for, um, you know, a, a, a pretty good record in our conference and potentially, you know, you never know what happens in the tournament, but uh, I thought we had a, a, you know, solid team this year. So Yeah. No, it's so fortunate. I mean, I got the master 
uh, right next to us with Murata with the pregame speech. So, Manny, I want to know, like, what's your message to guys? Like, you know, you, you guys stumble out the gate. What's something that you like to say to the team? I think I think Kev's right. I mean, you know, if you're playing tight, and a lot of times it happens a lot with, you know, Northeast teams where, you know, they might be limited depending on weather in the gym and you go down and you play, you know, an FIU. So, you know, that's kind of par for the course of the Northeast team. But, to rattle off nine wins, I mean, that's, you know, you're hotter than anybody at that point. So, you know, I think the message, like Kev said, has got to be more, hey, listen, you know, we were playing scared a little bit. This isn't Fordham baseball, you know, conference champions the year before. You know, obviously, Kev's won a lot of Manhattan, and you see why right there. Um, you know, a after a loss like that, to kind of rattle those off, I think, you know, you see what type of coach Kev is, obviously. Yeah, yeah. No, I was thinking I, – I thought maybe Kev did, pulled a little uh, major league and put all the bat – made the bat grave and, you know, maybe set a bonfire and got, got, some, new, got some new lumber in there. So No, I think the best thing as a coach, you could just say, uh, you know, guys, we got to pick it up. And, uh, you know, the players respond. You know, the guys played really well. And um, uh, I'd be crazy to take any credit for, for what we did there in that sense. So – um, yeah, you know, I just thought it was, um, the guys need a little bit of time. We're playing good competition. And, um, you know, once we figured it out, once they got rolling, it was, um, we looked like we were pretty tough to stop. So, yeah, that's what I love about you, Kev. I mean, you just got this awesome personality. You played it. You understand how difficult this is. And you, you're not like a guy that's going to choke somebody or like rip somebody's helmet off and go nuts. It's kind of like, you know, Hey, we just got to figure it out. You know, that's, it's baseball, right? There's no secret. You just got to kind of, like you said, make those adjustments and, and figure out just the way to win. And I, I, I couldn't read more with like that chemistry part. Sometimes in the beginning, it takes time. And it's almost a good thing to kind of get beat up early because you get to figure out what that identity is and the, the character of your players. So that's kind of cool to see. You get beat up. And then as a coaching staff, maybe you're like, hey, let's sit back and see what these guys do behind the scenes. Maybe, you know, that's where you see leaders kind of evolve from stuff like that. Yeah, and I've I've learned over the years. I mean, I think every coach has. You know, you have to um, adjust and, and um, evolve as a coach. Um, but I, I, I remember playing years ago, and um, one of the guys that uh, coached me, and he always talked about, like, you know, if the coach is um, – up and down like a roller coaster it's, it's like you know you can't play for a guy like that and I've you know trust me I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I'll, I'll have my um, ups and downs uh, and you know kind of just lose it on certain days but um, you know I've had to remind myself like you, the best thing would be is calm and and um, try to re reassure guys but also you know every once in a while you need a little kick in the butt and um, a wake-up call or you know, remind people that this is unacceptable. And, um, but, um, that's the, that's the give and take the back and forth, I think with, um, with coaching is, um, you know, the, the amount of times I've driven home and said, man, did I lose the team today? You know, there's been a, a number of those um, because of, uh, you know, I may have, um, laid into them a little bit, but, um, you know, that stuff happens. And I think, uh, our guys, have responded well to me. They know what to expect from me. So yeah, yeah, that's funny. I feel the same way sometimes with, with like my ten year old. I was talking. I mean, our uh, the ten year old team that I have in, in the little league. It's funny. I was just talking to Beretti with Columbia the other day about it. You know, we lost in the districts to like you know one of the the other teams, and you dig into your guys, and then you're like, Jesus, they're only ten years old. You know, like you don't want to lose these guys. You want to make sure. But uh, again, it's sometimes it's good that tough love that they know you care, right? Because maybe if you don't show a little bit of fire, it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, coach is just kind of, you know. Yeah. And the, the word that we talked about with Coach Beretti was passion, right? Like sometimes those players want to see a little bit of that spark. So, you yeah. know, maybe Maddie rips out the Belichick sweatshirt at the next practice or something and gets it going. But uh, before we get to these the kids' questions, I, I did have one question of my own. Um, not sure how many people know this, but Vince Scully, the, the future Hall of Famer and former announcer for the Dodgers, played outfield for Fordham. Um, how cool is it to meet him? And do you have any cool Vince Scully moments, or did he have any stories that, you, that you know, stick out to you? Um, I mean, that was incredible. So 2015, 
um, we were going out to play USC and uh, reached out to um, uh, one of the people at Fordham, you know, to see if he could put me in touch with uh, Vin Scully. And, and, you know, I was able to, I was, one of my stories about this is like, I was emailing Vin Scully and I'm just saying, as I'm emailing, awesome. yeah, how cool it is, but also like, so frustrating because, you know, you want to hear his voice and you want to talk to him. But um, back in 2015, emailed, set it all up, and we went out and um, we had lunch, um, you know, team lunch before our game at USC and kind of surprised our guys with, you know, Vince Scully was there to have lunch with the team. So um, That's awesome. just, just sitting there listening to him um, – and I said it to him, I mean, it's true, you know, he could read the ingredients on, you know, uh, um, the, I think we were talking about like the sugar packet, you know, he, the, um, the, uh, like a sweet and low packet, he could read that and you'd so be. So he could turn saying, anything wow. into gold. <laughs> yeah, that was, you know, more or less like, wow, this is so amazing. And, um, but the cool thing was uh, just meeting him and talking to him, he was, incredibly down to earth the the nicest guy you'll ever meet um you know you would not you know with all his fame and and everything like um he didn't oh, yeah. you know some people would maybe brush you off and kind of uh push you aside but it was more or less he made it feel like we were doing him a favor uh by having lunch with him and that was i thought the coolest part um seeing our guys interact with him um but then last year when we won um reached out to him and he called the team and he went on for a good seemed like 10 minutes of uh, wow. stories and just, um, you know, to motivate our guys. And um, so hearing his voice is tremendous. And I, you know, that's one thing I said to him, man, I miss just flipping on MLB network um, since he's retired and falling asleep on the East coast to a Dodger game you know, on a Tuesday night at 11, 11.30 at night and hearing, oh yeah, um, yeah, Vince Scully's voice. So, um, What I thought was pretty cool, too, was I looked him up. He hit his only Fordham home run against Yale, and George, George Bush Sr. was on that Yale team, which was pretty cool. Yeah. He said that, that means that's awesome. It's cool. Uh, you know, we talk about him a lot when we're recruiting guys and, and stuff, and um, – a lot of guys still know his name, but it's not like he just went to Fordham. I mean, he played, he was an outfielder, you know, so that's the, I think the really cool part about Vin with, um, with us and, and the history. So. Oh yeah. Plus we also got two of my favorite actors. Well, one of my favorite actors and then one of, uh, and I'll go into the other one, but you got Denzel who yeah. went to Fordham and played basketball there. And then you got my favorite and probably Murata's favorite too. We love something, the movie, something about Mary. Matt, Matt Dillon's dad, the golf coach there, right? Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> he was actually on a call yesterday. So awesome guy. I mean, I haven't talked to him a ton, but um, that was when I first got to Fordham, I had heard that. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> so, uh, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, but Did yeah, you get on the golf course with him or what? No, I, I haven't. Um, but uh, I know he's got some pretty good connections with some of the you know, good golf courses around. I just don't know if they'll let me on, you know, if they see me swing. So I'm like, yeah, that, yeah, they don't want you to outdrive anyone. Okay? I think that's it. They don't want you to mash the ball. No, uh, <laughs> but um, Denzel is pretty cool. That's something we haven't reached out to him, but um, but awesome that he's you know, he's another name that we mentioned to the guys. When we oh yeah, around. a lot of a lot of uh, royalty and Michael K and all that. But again, let's get to the. Let's get to the kids, though, because I know I could go on for, for hours with this. So we'll start yeah. it off. Who had the biggest impact on your baseball career, and, and what made you successful in your baseball career? Uh, that's tough. I mean, um, definitely my dad. I would say my dad definitely had the biggest impact. And um, honestly, I think the, the best part about it was he was not um, uh, one of these uh, overreaching – uh, parents, I guess, is maybe the best way to put it. He, you know, he let um, – I have a twin brother, so he let us go through the process throughout Little League and, and high school. Um, everything was a lot different back then. But, uh, you know, he didn't coach us in the sense of um, uh, coaching. Trying to go pro. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely not. But um, 
he didn't he didn't overstep the bound boundary of um you know with the parent and coach uh and i felt like that was good for you know me and also my twin brother in the sense of um yeah you couldn't go home and cry to um coach uh also your dad you know it was um he we more or less had to earn our own way through i thought um compared to sometimes what you see today but um you know he i think in general with sports i mean he kind of introduced us to everything and and pushed us um you know and motivated us you know, more or less in like that tough love sort of way you know which used to happen compared to um sometimes what you see now but um, yeah yeah but I, and I would also say my brother, I mean, my, I have a twin brother. So I always had somebody to play catch with or go to the field with and hit with. And that was awesome growing up having that, you know, so. Yeah. Compared to maybe being like an only child. And, um, you know, so I had a different, I guess, uh, upbringing with having a twin brother. So, but um, definitely my dad. And then as you get older, there's more influences and go through the stages. Definitely, you know, coach Shepard at Seton Hall. Uh, yeah. My high school coach, Ron Dolan. So it's hard to put it just to one. Um, yeah. But I would say my dad and then coach Dolan from high school and then coach Shepard uh, in college. So. Were you a big weight guy or did you just kind of like uh, to get outside and do multiple things or. No, in high school, um, uh, one of the health and phys ed teachers, um, Coach Walsh, when I was like a sophomore, I think he was trying to get my brother and I to play football because he was a football coach. Um, he was trying to get us in the weight room. So I started getting in the weight room when I was you know, 15 and definitely felt like that helped. Um, you know, and and I, I enjoyed working out throughout college and, and lifting and, and stuff like that. And the competitiveness, but, um, but yeah, not, nothing crazy, but. Yeah. For people that don't know this, Kev's probably got the, the, the biggest calves I've ever seen on anyone. It's like a horse. So. I, could be God I given. Think, could be God given. <laughs> I always say like, uh, I mean, I don't know what we did as kids, but I, I know we would, we skied. Um, I played soccer. Um, and definitely, you know, I guess I have some genetics in the lower half, I guess you could say, <laughs> from, uh, from my legs and stuff. But um, I don't really feel like I focused on that as far as like lifting. So um, it was more or less, um, I think, growing up, constantly playing sports in the neighborhood. And then um, I give a lot of credit to skiing and soccer. So <laughs> There you go. So if you're a skier, get out there, guys. Maddie, yeah. what about you? I mean, we talk about... Kev was just talking about, you know, his dad being more of that you need to create your own path where it almost seems like some of these parents today are putting so much pressure to like, you need to do this and you need to go, this will get you to college and stuff instead of just letting them have fun and letting it organically happen. Yeah. I mean, like I I agree with Kev. I think for me, I had so many great coaches, so many great mentors, you know, guys who played in the big leagues, you know, I was very fortunate to have a lot of those coaches. But for me, it was, it was my dad, you know, that everyday constant of, Hey, you want to hit at 6am you want to throw, you know, let's hit until dinner. I think, you know, no matter what, no matter, you know, what people I had in my life, you know, that was the constant for me where, you know, listen, he would be hard on me. We were brought up probably a little bit differently, like Kev said, than this generation. But uh, you know, the biggest thing about him was, you know, there wasn't really a high or there wasn't really a low. It was just kind of about the process. And, you know, I give him a lot of credit because he'd be, you know, working as a detective in the city, come home and be like, dad, let's go hit, you know, hadn't even taken his shoes off and he'd go out every time. So, you know, definitely have to give him a lot of credit. And I think the biggest thing for me was just him not coaching me after a certain age, you know, he kind of let me fail. Um, You know, I tell the story all the time, my freshman year of high school, I was a seven hitter and you know, I could have left that team and tried to be a three hitter on another team, but, you know, we had to sit down. He's like, listen, you're a seven hitter right now. Let's try and get better and, you know, be a five to three um, to two hitter maybe next year. And, you know, that's what we did. And I kind of made that a main focus. I feel like too many kids, they're quick to say, okay, hey, I'm not where I want to be. And and it's easy to kind of play the the blame game. And it's something I tell my college guys all the time, um, you know, 
boys have excuses, men have answers. You know, what that really means is ask yourself, you know, am I making an excuse or is this, you know, warranted? So, um, you know, I agree with Kev. I think that good mix of, you know, my father obviously being there um, on an everyday constant and having good coaches um, and good mentors around me. Yeah, that's awesome. I think there's one quote that, like, my dad would say that kind of stuck out. He always told me, he's like, listen, he's like, don't be upset if you didn't work for it. You know, you see so many kids, they strike out, or they don't do well, and they get upset, and it's like, well, did you really prepare for it? Like, you can't really be mad if you lost or you didn't do well if you didn't really put the work in. So that's something that always stuck out, you know. And it's like anything, like, oh, I didn't get the job, or I didn't do this, but it's like, did you really work hard to deserve it, right? I don't think people understand that there's a long-term path to really get to where you want. So um, that was pretty good. And let's get to the next one. All right, Kev, what do you look for when you recruit your Fordham Ram guys? And is it important for, for kids to attend your college camp or just in general to attend these camps to get that extra exposure in front of the whole coaching staff? Yeah, so um, the first part of that, I mean, it's, a, it's like an you know, overall picture of a guy. You know, that's kind of what we're looking for is um, everything. And – Again, you know, maybe we'll go back to the parents here a little bit, but there are games that we'll go to, whether it's a high school game or a summer league game, and, you know, we'll kind of be in the stand, sometimes not wearing anything for them or sometimes wearing for them. And, um, you know, you'll hear comments, and those are immediate, like, stay away comments sometimes, whether it's getting on an umpire or getting on a coach, um, you know, or you're just a little bit um, – crazy in the stands as a parent so that <laughs> listen um there's so many things that go into it more than just whether or not a kid can hit or run or throw um so at Fordham I mean obviously the academic um piece is big I mean we we um you know we need to get guys that uh, take their academics seriously um but obviously the intangibles that everybody else looks for I mean you know, we're looking for guys that can run, athletic. Uh, I want guys to play multiple sports. Um, I don't want a guy that just plays baseball. Uh, if I had my pick, you know, I, I, I love getting I – mean, we have a lot of guys that play football um, and baseball, obviously. And it's awesome because I, we look at it as, you know, this guy knows how to compete. This guy knows how to um, go after what he wants. He's uh, athletic. Um, he can handle uh, a full schedule of class and uh, football and baseball. I mean, we have a guy coming in that plays um, – he's a, he's a quarterback, um, plays hockey and baseball. He's a you know, pitcher, shortstop, um, um, and baseball. So you're talking about year-round. This guy is playing a sport, you know, committed – and doing all those things that is, is required to be the best that he can be on, on all levels there um, while also maintaining a high GPA. And, and that's where I feel like it only gets easier for him when he gets to college and now he's going to more or less have to focus on just baseball. So um, I couldn't agree more. And Coach Brady said the same thing. He loves guys that played multiple sports. Um, and it's just, again, like you play football, it's a, it's a different animal and it's like a tougher – so, again, that it goes back to, you know, it's, it's like a Swiss Army knife, right? Sometimes you do one thing and it's kind of like, well, this guy's done other things and, and you can see different intangibles, you know. So, yeah. I know I was a big sports guy. You know, I know Maddie was too. And listen, Maddie was a two-way college guy. I mean, he, he, he hopped on the course and was shooting uh, Tiger Woods numbers. So, again, <laughs> as a coach, you love, you love to see that kind of stuff. So, again, I like to hear it. And also, when – and Maddie's around the Little League as well. When you do something all the time, you're training those same muscles, and you could kind of burn those things out. So, yeah. And it's not saying don't put the, the bat or the ball down, but when you're playing football, you could always get a lesson or get wiffle ball in the backyard. But when you're doing this all year round, I mean, you even look at the pro guys. They're burnt out. They need that break. So for kids, it's, it's like the same thing. So I, I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah, I think it keeps them fresh, and, and you know, there's so many positives to doing all the different sports, uh, like we said. But, um, you know, on the other part of it, when you talk about camp, I mean, is it a necessity? No. Um, I think for our camps, a lot of times it's more or less like a – maybe we didn't know of a guy previous to him coming to our camp, and a, and a guy, you know, jumps out at us at camp. So now this is going to be a guy that we try to 
um, go after down the road or make sure we stay in contact with. Um, yeah. Or sometimes it's a guy that, um, you know, maybe I saw him or um, you know, maybe one of my assistants saw him, but I haven't. And it's a way for a guy to get on campus, you know, work out. Um, we can kind of gauge whether or not, you know, how coachable he is when we make, you know, we'll do like some small skill work sessions and we maybe suggest um, a small change or, you know, try it this way and see how they react. Um, but I think it's great for kids as far as like when you talk about prospect camp type of stuff, uh, it's just another opportunity to be in front of us. I I've always said this when we talk to the kids at our camp, you know, when they come to our camp, we know that they have some interest level in coming to Fordham. So that's part of the battle sometimes on our end as coaches is gauging, you know, the le legitimate interest that the kid has in our program. Um, so, um, you know, if they come. No, to and I'm going to, I'm going to stop you there. Cause I remember in 2015 when I was there, when, when we had the camp, we actually, I think we picked up a guy and offered somebody. Okay. So again, too, I think kids that, cause you see kids get signed so early eighth grade now, which is, you know, in my eyes, I think it's a little crazy, but you know, it's starting to get younger. Some of these guys develop later, right? I mean, you look at Jordan, right? He got cut. He grew five inches. I mean, you just don't know what's going to happen. So I think the camps are yeah. great because you could go one year, you could develop, and you go again, and the coach is like, hey, I remember you. You shook my hand. You shook the whole staff, and you came back, and you proved to me what you could do. And sometimes that, that stuff goes a long way. Not like you said, there's no guarantees. But, you know, I think, uh, I think it's a good thing. I mean, when, when I – think of our roster I mean the majority of our guys attended our, one of our camps at some point whether it was the first time we saw them or it was um, they just came uh, after they could committed just to kind of maybe we, we did a little um, hitting camp and um, you know for us it's awesome because we got an opportunity to kind of see them up close and again work with them um, whether they were committed or not um, you know, at that point, so. Yeah. Maddie, did you go to Kev's camp in high school? Uh, I don't know if I went to Kev's camp, but I definitely visited Manhattan. Um, and I think it was the year they had beat John B. Chamberlain the year before in the regional when he was at Nebraska. So I remember when I was staying with the players, oh, you know, nice. they were kind of telling me that story. It was pretty cool. Yeah, we That's didn't. That's awesome. We didn't run many camps at Manhattan. Um, I mean, I was, I got the job you know, rather young. And I was just so focused on um, just being able to run a program day in, day out. So we didn't have many camps, I can tell you that. Um, and, you know, a lot, lots changed over the years. So. Yeah. The Jaspers, baby. Shout out to my little brother who went to uh, Manhattan College. Took a lot yeah. of trips up there. I actually liked it. Yep. All right. I'll probably get yelled at for saying that, but okay. Cause he, he's, he, he's a man of, uh, Less words. He likes to stay incognito, but love you, little brother. Okay, what does a day of practice look like for your catchers? I know you're, you know, you were a catcher, so, you know, I want to see, uh, you know, I think the people want to hear kind of what uh, these guys go through. Uh, it depends on the year for me, in my opinion, uh, and it sometimes gets even, you know, slightly individualized per guy, but um, – I'll tell you, in the fall, I, I try to spend as much time with them as possible. In the spring, it gets a little harder because uh, we're playing games and I'm you know, the head coach. So um, it's a little tricky there. But uh, in the fall, I mean, we'll do a lot of drill work. I've, I've geared and shifted over the last couple of years here, uh, partly from Coach Datoma, who was with me at um, oh, yeah. at Fordham and now at, at FDU. Um, and I watched him with our infielders. And one of the things he did um, with our infielders was he had, he called them dailies. So every day they had to do certain lead up uh, type of uh, drill work. And I loved it because they were getting that reinforcement constant. Um, so I started to implement that with the catchers where we, we would do dailies. We would more or less pick from a list. Um, and I heard it described this year, I think, um, um, I can't remember where it was, either a convention or, or podcast or something, more or less like a menu. Um, 
So I came up with like a menu for receiving drills, a menu for blocking, a menu for um, throwing. So um, something in that where we can say to our guys, okay, we're going to pick three from here, three from here, and three from here. And it gives them a little bit of um, – they, they make those choices where they can have a little bit more say in what happens. Um, but uh, I am, I think, harder on our catchers than anybody else at our program. Um, when we had the kid, uh, Justin Bardwell, a couple of years, I mean, he graduated last year, 2019. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and he did a lot of the catching day in and day out. Um, and I write the lineup. So, you know, that was um, my doing, I guess. So, but I, I knew if I took him in the spring and we do blocking drills and we, we spend 40 minutes on uh, being in the crouch and all this stuff, um, I think it would wear him down. So in the spring, I pretty much left him alone. Um, we would do a lot of times my focus in the fall is um, receiving blocking. Um, my focus in the spring is going to be footwork and throwing um i think i can maybe when you think about receiving and blocking um more or less beat up on them a little bit more in the fall where we're not playing games um and in the spring you know i lay off the blocking um and do a little bit more just throwing where it's going to be light it'll be five or six um reps and kind of like uh extra credit or um a fun exercise. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, But yeah, it's hard, you know, based on the day, it depends. Um, But that's what I've kind of shifted to. We've gone like, we'll do like individual workouts with our guys. Uh, Well, I'll get the catchers and we'll go for 40 40 to 45 minutes, let's say, and kind of break it down into mostly receiving blocking in the, in the fall. You know, keeping in mind that they are catching the pitchers a lot. So they did all the work in there. Some of the best stuff I've ever done is, um, you know, when I was in college, I, I was I got hurt one year and I couldn't play, so uh, Shep told me to umpire, and I'm putting, you know, <laughs> inner squatting, and I'm back there with, um, you know, uh, catcher's gear on, and I'm umping, and I real that's when I realized, like, number one, this this is not easy, because <laughs> I'm getting yeah. fooled left umping, and number two, like. <laughs> The view you have back there, it's important. So I've always done that with our catchers since I've started coaching is like, I want you behind him. I want you to umpire and just not in a, not an inner squad setting, but um, when we're working the machine, the breaking ball machine, um, you know, if I got three catchers, I'll have one guy standing as a hitter. One guy is catching and one guy is umping just so they get that view of what it's like to be an umpire. And you know, I'm going to stop you there because I think, I actually think that's genius almost because as a catcher, if you're watching from an umpire's point of view, you can almost learn stuff like, oh, wow, like by setting up like this or, right, you could kind of learn like I'm not getting that call because maybe this is not what I'm doing. But it's, you know, guys are getting lower and lower and it's kind of they're getting that extra inch. So I guess yep. it's like when, you, when you're standing back there, you could almost put yourself like, Hey, if maybe I could, if he could set, you know, I think the feedback's great. You know, you set up here, you might be able to get this for a strike instead of kind of setting up that way. Yeah, no doubt. That's what we've, um, you know, I've always been a proponent of being on one knee or dropping a knee as you receive. Uh, It's crazy to see some of this, not crazy, but a lot of the stuff that they're talking about now with catching is things that we've kind of um, thought about in my head. If you watch, I mean, that, that game, that YouTube game of um, Nebraska with, with Nick Durba catching, who's now the head coach at Maine, tremendous catcher. I mean, I didn't have to do much with him, but um, <laughs> he was incredibly athletic. But if you watch him catch in that game, it's on YouTube. If you YouTube the Manhattan-Nebraska uh, game. I have to check that out. You'll see. I mean, he drops a knee often. And this is, you know, you're talking, uh, you know, 14 years ago. Um, and because I, I – believed in it that's what we talked about um a lot of guys would tell you know tell catchers like that extra movement um and i always felt like it's the best way to catch the low pitch so it's pretty um it's pretty neat that you're seeing guys go to a knee uh and i've even evolved with that um 
and I'm debating even next year, just seeing maybe in the inner squad in the fall with our catchers. Um, all right, let's screw it. You know, cause I'm not really a um, proponent of being on a knee all the time, but yeah, I haven't done, I haven't done it with our guys and you're seeing big leaguers catch on a knee with a yeah. runner on first. Look at Sir, you look at Cervelli, you think he's tearing something. He's getting so flexible down there and stuff. So well, Matty, it, what do you think as a pitcher? Do you like it when like, I mean, and I, what am I trying to look for here? I mean, if the catcher can get you those strikes that are balls, I mean, how big is that? And is that something that you talk to your guys about? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, our catchers will tell you I'm his best friend for probably the first, you know, three weeks. I'm trying to get him to understand, you know, where he wants to set up. If he catches a fastball away in the middle of his body, you know, we might get that call more times than not if he's, you know, reaching across. So, you know, I think the biggest thing for catching, like Kev was saying, with even just the umpiring is, you know, be able to catch different pitchers in the bullpen. Um, you know, I know Coach Breddy talked about it a lot. It's it's a tough balance because, you know, catchers get beat up. So, obviously, the way Kev does it is a little bit more intense in the fall. And then once they're playing their games, you know, it might be a different focus like footwork and throwing. Um, you know, so the same is true. You, you don't want to beat them up. You know, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. But, you know, definitely – I force them to catch a lot of different pitchers, um, especially if they're the starting starting catcher. I mean, just so many different looks. And, I mean, Kev's done it. You know, if you get a guy who's 91-93 and then the next inning you get a sub guy who throws a Frisbee, you know, if you haven't seen that Frisbee-type breaking ball, you know, then a pass ball could happen in a big spot. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's the hardest position in the world because you have to be constantly locked in. Um, but for sure, I mean, stealing pitches is everything, especially if you know a pitch kind of works late. You know, hey, maybe I'm a foot further back where now I could steal a strike. Um, you know, there's just so much to it. Yeah, no doubt. All right, let's get to the next question. Actually, I want to shout out two catchers, Kevin. I'm sure you remember these names. Chuck, Chuck Galliano and Patty Gardner. Yeah. Those yeah. are the guys. Those are the guys when I was there. Man, did they, they get after it and – I think a yep. big part too is is competing makes them better. I mean, those guys, you know, they would they would make each other better because they were trying to compete with each other, and I love seeing that. So that was, you know, shout out to those guys. They were awesome. Yeah. I love those guys. I mean, Chuck uh, Charlie was, um, God, I think probably my first commit. Uh, oh yeah, he was drafted too, right? Yeah, because he probably he committed to me at Manhattan, and then I, I remember telling him like, listen, you know, that's awesome. He said yes, but I. I you know, within a couple of days here, I may have news for you. So. <laughs> but yeah, Charlie, um, and Charlie's fall, his first fall, he, I was all over him. Uh, and I'm sure he would tell you that, but and Patty, I, I love Pat. I felt like he, um, you know, improved every year that he was with us. And, um, you know, his senior year, he had more or less like a, a breakout and really, um, contributed a lot more than, than, uh, what maybe we, we thought. And, um, you know, happy for him. But, you know, when you see guys kind of um, progress as they go and, and finish yeah. up on a high note. So, yeah, no doubt. Now he's the Wolf of Wall Street. He took that confidence to the yeah. uh, to the stock market or wherever he is in the finance world. Yeah. All right. This is my cup of tea. I, I like this. What drills do you like to use for hitting? And before before I'll let you answer, because I use this today. I mean, I love hitting the soccer balls and the heavy bag. Yeah. And I tell my kids that, too, all the time. I, I got them hit, hitting the heavy stuff and getting the wrist. And I know you're a big get those forearms strong and stuff. So, yeah. I'll let you take it. Um, it the hitting stuff, I listen, I, I think drills are good. Um, you know, I, I think some – like, I think of hitting the soccer balls not so much as a drill, more as, like, a, as an exercise. A, yeah. A conditioning type thing. And um, – you know, you feel it when you don't hit the ball right because it kind of whacks your wrist a little bit. Um, oh, yeah. But, I, you know, I think each guy needs to kind of have like a tailored routine of, um, you know, what gets them maybe back on track. I mean, we introduce a lot of different things with our guys, whether it's like a step back or, excuse me, a rhythm drill or whatnot. Um, but ultimately everything for me is ground up, um, you know, do you have a uh, solid athletic base when your foot hits the ground, whatever you want to call it, when you take your stride? Um, mm -hmm. 
You know, are you in a good athletic position? Because if you're in a good athletic position, I feel like a lot of things can happen from there. Um, and I've, I've talked a lot about hitting uh, more or less like a punch. Um, you know, when you, not that I would um, uh, condone it, but if you're gonna, <laughs> if you're gonna land and punch somebody, if you really gotta um, get into them, um, you know, not just uh, give them one little jab. If, if you really had to, you know, put it to them on one punch, um, I bet you you would step into it. You would stride. You'd load into your backside. And when you landed on your, um, on your front side, you would start to feel that momentum shift going towards the front side. And then as you deliver the punch, everything more or less like at contact, your front side's going to stiffen out and, um, and, and, you know, boom, you're going to hit. So, um, I think there's key components that I look for. Um, some of the drill work that we do is kind of tailored to it. Um, you know, I, I, I always start with the base and then maybe work, work our way up. Maybe, um, you know, is their elbow above their hands? You know, the back elbow is something I, I look for. Um, I'm not saying you can't be successful hitting that way because there are guys that do it, but um, yeah. I, I like it with our, our back elbow is slightly below our hands. Um, but even throwing a Frisbee, I mean, it's crazy, sounds crazy, but um, – um, we'll have our guys, I haven't done it with them, but I tell them to think about throwing a Frisbee or skipping a rock. Um, it's a similar position. Um, for me being a lefty hitter and a right-handed thrower, it makes sense easily with my bottom hand to, if I'm going to throw that Frisbee, that's more or less the same type of movement with my swing, uh, with the elbow. So, and they talked about that at the network too. Big Sean Casey likes that. That yeah. frisbee rock, because it's that same motion of you got to get through it, and you know that's that the feeling you have to have. Yeah, so, so. If I, you know, if I was um, maybe doing instructional stuff with little guys, or um, you know, if I had a lesson, maybe you know, it sounds crazy, but if you had a frisbee and you said, okay, we're gonna warm up um, playing the frisbee toss, but even for a, um, you know, if I was a righty righty, I'd want to throw it this way. You know, if, if that's the same movement with my top hand, so. Yeah, um, that's true, because you got to stay through to throw it. You start getting, you know, yeah. too wristy, you're not going to be able to flick it nice. So yeah. uh, what I like, <laughs> yeah, we don't know. Kev's actually a Frisbee legend, probably. Yeah. He probably throws it out of Hulahan <laughs> Park. <laughs> uh, but it's, I mean, I, I, it's so hard. I mean, we've gotten, we've gotten a lot of drills, um, you know, done a lot of different things. Um, well, I like that you don't cookie cut it. You kind of let guys feel to where they need it, right? Because some yeah. guys want to work on one thing and then – so. And, again, I think we go back – listen, we have, you know, typically a full year with our guys where we can um, evaluate and kind of feel them out. So the first few weeks of the fall, a lot of times it's, it's it may not be cookie cutter. It may be this is what we're doing. These Today we're going to do these three drills and then we're going to hit for ten minutes. Tomorrow we're going to do these three drills and then we're going to hit for 10 minutes. So um, yeah. more or less to see how they react and um, if they like a certain drill. And a lot of times at, at the end of the fall, we'll tell them, you know, we'll have them uh, fill out some, uh, whether it's an index card or a survey online, like what are your go-to drills? Um, so that way we kind of, we can kind of gear stuff towards them individually, but also use our eyes and see what we think would work with them. Yeah, no, I agree. I think Maddie and I have to come to uh, to Houlihan Park and we'll do a kids clinic and I'm going to put that catcher's thing on him or the umpire's chest protector. I'm going to have you punch me yeah. right in the chest and talk about that staying tight. And <laughs> but honestly, like when you talk about favorite drill, I think my favorite drill is just the hit. You know, I mean, that's, I think that's one of the biggest, you know, potential problems with young guys uh, uh, today and, and it's not just young guys, it's everybody, everybody, you know, ever since cell phones came out, we're always looking for like, that. oh my gosh, yes. The quick fix. Well, it's funny, you know, it's funny. I don't know. I, I, I'm totally with you on that. Everyone's trying to reinvent the wheel and do this crazy drill. And, I, and Maddie, I'm going to say too, it's all about just keep it simple. And Maddie talks about this all the time with his pictures, right? I mean, Matt, you say the same thing. Am I, am I wrong? No, I mean, I, I think you can almost relate it to boxing, right? I, I could I could hit a, a boxing bag as much as I want, but, you know, once the bell goes on and I have to actually fight someone, 
you know, it's a little bit different, you know, so just like hitting, like, there's nothing that can really supplement it. Uh, you know, I like challenging my guys. I think, you know, with the younger guys, the high school guys, you know, trying to force them to get in their lower half is tough at times. So what I'll do if they're not in their lower half is, you know, I'll do a bounce drill. I'll simulate breaking ball, change up slider, and I'll make them kind of call it out. So, you know, for me, it does two things. It kind of forces them to see, okay, hey, I'm not in my lower half. I can't hit these pitches. So let's make an adjustment. And then the second is, you know, just forcing their body to react, force them to see, you know, it might be 20 bounce sliders, but, you know, they're seeing the movement, they're seeing the spin. So, you know, I, I think the grill, the drills are great, but, you know, challenge the guys as much as possible. You know, you want them to be athletes too. Yeah. I just remember when I was playing, just taking BP, maybe if I took five rounds, I mean, even if when I was younger, just pitching, this is such a game of feel where you're like hitting or you're throwing, you're like, oh, wow, this clicks if I do this or if I do that. So I couldn't agree more with Kev where it's sometimes it's just so simple as just keep doing it and you could kind of just feel things that click, you know, and it's probably the same for a pitcher. You're throwing a bullpen and it's like, hey, do this with your fingers or, or do this a little bit more with your backside. And you're like, wow, like that actually helped instead of yeah. doing great, you know, these crazy drills. What and do you I think of love- Maddie? I love what Kevin said. I mean, what you, what he's really doing by putting out that menu is, you know, having them basically try these different drills that him and his staff have picked out. But, you know, once they like four or five, that's their routine. You know, he's really helping them build their routine, you know, recommended drills. So, uh, you know, I, I love that. I think that's great. I think every animal is different. Every animal, you know, likes to do different things, whether it be, you know, their first round of BP, their, pre-pitch um you know before they're in the box maybe they're flip stuff so you know I think you got to kind of let them be unique and you know kind of tailor them towards things that obviously work but you know help them kind of build that routine um you know build that pre yeah I think it goes back to this quote I was watching the other guys Mark Wahlberg I'm a peacock you gotta let me fly baby I mean that's (laughs) that's what it comes down to you gotta let these guys kind of be an athlete and get out there yeah. And that brings us to the money ball question, Kev. It's no stumpers here, but Maddie's got two questions, so I'm gonna let him let him take it us take it away. All right, Kev. I got one serious question uh, and one non-serious. I'll start with the non-serious. Uh, favorite movie for the bus or the, the movie that nice. the guys go to a lot? Oh God! I mean, I'm I am awful with movies. I'm terrible with quotes and. <laughs> <laughs> Maddie will tell you this. I mean, we'll be in the office, and um, you know, one of I, either I'll say something, or one of my assistants will say something, and I'm like, "What are you talking about?" And then, <laughs> these three assistants are looking at each other like, "Yeah, he just doesn't know." And I'm like, and then they'll say the movie that it came from. I'm like, "Yeah, I saw that movie, but I can't. I don't." I'm put- dying because me, Robbie, and Jimmy would would say <laughs> these quotes. And Kevin, what are you guys talking about? Yeah. We're like, "Come on, man, you don't know this." So, and that's another thing I'll tell you that I, I miss about, um, you know, not so much when I played because the, uh, the TVs were like four inches, but, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago when you get on the bus and you would have, you know, three or four movies. I mean, we put on some movies um, on the bus and I'll, I'll look to the back and there's nobody watching the movie except for me. And then you know, oh, it's just six screens or whatever, eight screens. <laughs> they're now enormous. They're beautiful screens on the buses now. They're awesome. But um, nobody watches the movie. We don't even bring movies because they all have their, their laptops or iPads. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're all watching their own movies. So it's kind of like that stuff has gone away. But I'll tell you, I, I love the movie Slapshot is tremendous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'll go with Slapshot. I wish they didn't have so much of the uh, romance, the the romance part of it. I wish it was a little bit more. Hot. Paul, New- Paul Newman, right? Yeah, but I just love when they're skating and their jock straps. Once they yeah. win it, stuff. Again, this might not be PG for the kids. Yeah. I just remember watching this with my dad and his brothers, and I'm like ten years old, laughing my, you know what? So that that's great. Old school, old school hockey. Uh, so that, that I guess that would be my pick if. Uh, but honestly, Maddie, that's probably because I can't think of too many movies off the top of my head. I'm just not a movie. All right, so I'm going to replace that question really quick for Maddie on the gun then. What's the favorite? Well, you probably got a favorite restaurant, but how about that dinosaur rib place we went to? Um, are you talking uh, 
down in uh, were we in Texas or where the hell were we? No, we, this was in in the city. Oh, down when down. I was there, remember yeah. we took the, we took the bus we took the van to this place and just ate yeah. like kings. Yeah, dinosaur barbecue was. That's where we went. I think. Um, that's where me, you, and Maddie are going. We're gonna go. To, <laughs> we're gonna Chris and Maddie with that. <laughs> I love. I mean, barbecue is tremendous. I love um, definitely ribs and and um, um, what am I blanking on? Um, I Old pork. Remember. Old pork. Uh, briskets. Oh briskets. yeah. Sorry. Briskets. Oh yeah. Briskets. What I'm uh, definitely missing most through the quarantines. <laughs> oh yeah. But too funny. All right, Kev, um, you kind of mentioned this before. I think this is great to kind of get out there. Um, you know, parents in the recruiting process, I know these people think that they're behind the scenes, but, you know, can you kind of explain a little bit how you guys see a lot more than parents uh, think you see? You know, you could see them in the stands and, you know, how college baseball is very different from travel when it comes to playing time. You know, everything's earned. So, you know, kind of just give us an example of – or not an example, but – um, you know, how, how important, you know, are the parents in this recruiting process, um, you know, and can it affect the kid? Yeah, definitely. I mean, my example before, for sure, <laughs> you can affect, um, affect things in a negative way. I mean, nobody, you know, as a coach, all of us um, understand the whole process and know that there is parent involvement. Like, it, you know, we, we understand that you, you need to have a, you know, more or less a, a part of the pie as far as the decision making goes but um you know definitely i think parents rarely can you affect your child in like a positive way uh, most of the time as far as you know college coaches most of the time it's going to be a negative so um my advice to parents there would be blend in you know when you when you're talking about um at that recruiting age um try not to stand out uh, don't be the vocal parent um unless you're the guy, the person that's just cheering for your, for your son and, and the teams. But um, none of us really want a, um, you know, a parent that's going to be overbearing, uh, who's going to try to, um, you know, manipulate um, other parents and things like that. So it's, it's yeah. one of the things where, yes, it can affect you in a way that maybe we just say, you know what, I mean, I have the ability to more or less put together our roster. So, um, I can say, even though I love this kid because he runs a six, six and he, he hits the ball 400 feet, I can say to myself, you know what? I don't know if I want to deal with the, the, the other stuff that comes along with, with this guy. And most of the time it's not the parents. A lot of times it's maybe some other issue. And, and, and like you said, Maddie, I mean, the biggest things for, for players, I mean, we watch, if we're there recruiting a guy, um, uh, we are watching everything you do. So um, from the minute that you, at least I think people that are doing their job, um, from the minute that you show up to the park, you know, does your mom carry your bag or do you carry your bag? Um, do you, <laughs> do you hustle out to your position after you, you know, make out? Um, do you run hard to first base when you hit a ground ball? Um, you know, all these little things that like, these are, areas where we're checking the boxes of do we want this guy um you can go for five and we still like you but if you go for five uh or i guess i should reverse that if you go three for five but in your you know one hit you could have maybe pushed it harder around first base uh, and then your two where you flew out you just jogged to the dugout instead of jog, you know running hard around first base i'd rather have the over five that um did everything the way i want them to um, if all is the same in the sense of we like your swing, uh, we like how you throw, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I'm not going to, we're not going to recruit a guy that, um, you know, at the end of the day, we don't feel can, um, play at our level, um, just because he runs hard to first, but, um, we will not recruit a guy, um, you know, that does those things that we don't like. So I think, and I, again, I, I think of my upbringing, um, you know, I never was made to feel special. Like you're so good. Um, you know, I think that was another thing going back to my dad. That was awesome that he did. He didn't, he didn't really treat me like I was a superstar or anything like that. Um, 
And I think the biggest thing high school age kids can understand at this point, no matter how good you are, there's somebody out there that's better. Um, and there are so many options for us to um, recruit and you know, go after other guys. There's so many kids out there that why should we recruit, you know, player X um, and only player X has that answer. Um, so you got to, you know, I think that, was, that would be my advice to guys. Like, I could not agree more with that, Kev. I think you hit it right on the head. You guys have every option and there's so many choices. So why, why would I bend the rules just for someone like that? And it's funny. I'm sure Maddie could say the same thing because I've been around the showcase circuit and seen it almost seems like the bad stuff almost sticks out more than the good stuff. Because yeah. so many you see guys hitting and stuff. And you, you notice that one thing when that kid shows up a teammate or he throws his helmet and you're just like, you know, that's a damn shame because this kid was looking pretty good until he pulled something like that. Yeah. And, and you know how it is, Matty. I mean, we'll, you know, when you sit at these um, events or showcases or tournaments, I mean, we'll see, I don't know, a thousand kids in a weekend. <laughs> so oh yeah, if you're at one of those big, um, you know, showcase events, where it's, you're talking about 250 kids in a two day setting and um, you do that for a few days, you just, um, you know, you got to find a way as if you're that player, you got to find a way to um, stand out and yeah. um, not in a negative way. So um, yeah, that's um, I think a big part of it. And um, you know, like I said, uh, for, for mom and dad and, and whatnot, if I, it is a hard thing. Um, but you have to trust that everything is going to work out the way it should. Um, that's one of my things I try to tell people also is like, you know, um, you got to read through some of the, um, you know, some of the stuff that's uh, a little bit fluff, but um, at the end of the day, you know, everything sorts itself out and, and guys end up where they should typically um, through the recruiting process. So, if you're not getting like legit interest from you know, certain schools, maybe, you know, it's not so much that those schools are wrong. You know, maybe we got to look at other options. So, um, yeah, no, Hey, listen, that's why there's so many schools out there. So many programs, you know, you got, sometimes you can't force it, right. You got to find the right fit and, you know, usually it happens. Sometimes it doesn't, but yeah. again, that's life, right? There's no guarantees. You just got to work hard and make sure you do your homework and, uh, things usually fall into place. So, I mean, but I agree with you with kids these days. I think, you know, they need to stop kind of hanging on to mom and dad and just kind of take ownership about things. And, you know, they can't expect them to do everything. Maddie, Matt will be the first one to say this. We played for a pretty tough coach in high school, uh, with Leon Matthews. And, um, and if he's listening, he rode me very hard. And I, you know what? I had so much respect for the guy. There was times that during practice, I'd come home and, you know, I'd, I'd be like, man, I don't know if I could do this and stuff. And you know what? My parents could have like called them or done something. They never reached out to him. Never, never went against anything. And they just said, listen, if you want to quit, quit. But this is life. You, you know, you commit and you just keep working hard. And I just have so much respect for him. And I, and, you know, after high school, he has so much respect for me and, be honest, I can't thank them enough because I think that's a real taste of just the real world in general, where it, you know, these kids are going to get out of high school or college and it's not easy at all. And I think that's, you know, we need to do a job of society to raise these guys to be ready, you know, because when times are hard, they're going to, are they just going to fold up or are they going to, you know, man up? So I think, uh, you know, that's why I enjoy the development because I am, it's tough love and these kids know that I'm there, but I'm also going to push them a little bit beyond that comfort, that comfort level. So yeah, no doubt. Maddie, what do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, everything you guys are saying is, is spot on. I think, you know, listen, the parents, they want to get involved. I understand that, you know, help your kid pick your major, be with them every step of the way, but, you know, let the coaches recruit. And like Kev's saying, you know, if he doesn't have offers in the Atlantic 10, then, you know, maybe Fordham might not be for him. You got to be realistic. You know, there is a place for everybody. But, you know, I think the biggest thing that kids don't understand is they might not get a ground ball. They might not get a play at the plate. But, you know, in between innings, you can control hustling on the field. 
Um, you know, you can control making Chris throws to first base. You know, like coaches can tell, you know, who's taking two minutes off. And I think the biggest thing that people don't realize is, you know, Kev does watch people, you know, show up to the field. And I think too many parents don't really realize that, that, you know, they want to see everything. They're going to spend, you know, four years together. So, you know, just as much as you got to be a talented baseball player and the grades have to be there, you got to be a good person too. So, um, you know, Kev, I thought that was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, you heard it. If you're listening out there, don't talk with your mouth. Talk with your bat and your play and your attitude. You know, it's easy to talk, talk to talk, but you might as well just walk it. So, Kev, this was awesome, man. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm excited. I know I haven't come seeing you. Shame on me. But that's what happens when you get kids and, I know. you know, that's that's the life. But Maddie and I are definitely going to make the effort to come out to Hulahan Park. Maybe we'll take some BP. We'll hit some homers. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Kev. We appreciate it. All right, guys. Great seeing you. Yeah, you See too. You. Take care. See you.